All right, it's good to see you folks here this evening. We're uh, going to do something a little different. I'm not answering any questions tonight uh, until after church, if you want me to. <laughs> but I want to. I want to. I'm going to do a study on the seven mysteries from the, for the New Testament, and this is going to take a couple of weeks to do. So I'm not going to rush through it because it's a it's a very important thing for us to know and understand and you'll see why here as, as we get started but uh i want to have a word of prayer and then we'll we'll get started heavenly father lord we do love you and thank you for loving us father i thank you for the folks who are here this evening and lord uh most of all i thank you for your word i thank you for your holy spirit that teaches us and guides us through your word lord so we're asking just now, Father, that you would allow that Holy Spirit to uh, teach us, Lord, to speak through me, and Lord, to make everything clear where we understand exactly what these seven mysteries are and why it's so important that we understand them. And Father, we'll just be careful to give you all the praise, all the honor, and all the glory. And we ask these things in Jesus' holy and precious name. Amen. So... If you got your Bibles, go over to 1 Corinthians chapter 4. First Corinthians chapter 4, the first two verses. First Corinthians chapter four, verse one says, let a man so account of us as of the ministers of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Moreover, it is required in stewards that a man be found faithful. So Paul is telling us that we are to be ministers and stewards of the mysteries of God. Now, I have to tell you, the first time that I really paid attention as I was reading through this verse, and I'm going, what? How am I supposed to be a steward of something that's a mystery? So, knowing that God would not require us to do something that we're not able to do, I decided I probably ought to figure out exactly what's being talked about here. Because if, if we're required to be stewards, first off, we need to know what, a, what the mystery is, what a mystery is from the biblical perspective, and then what a steward is. So I decided to find out. So here is the biblical definition of a mystery. It's a secret or mystery. In rabbinic writing, that's the writing of the rabbis, by the way, it denotes the mystic or hidden sense of an Old Testament saying. The Bible is written very much in mystery form. We'll talk about that. I know I've talked about it some before, but we'll talk about it here in a little bit. So I want, I want to break down for you what I just told you. God has written certain things in the Bible in such a way that a man can only understand it by the leading of the Holy Spirit of God and Him, the Holy Spirit, revealing it to Him. That's why when you read stuff in the Bible, sometimes you're going, what? What? What is this? You have to have the Holy Spirit of God teach it to you and reveal it to you. And sometimes, and I still struggle with this, there's sometimes I'll be reading a passage. In fact, I have a question that at some point I'm going to answer that I, I just seen this one. And I'm like, I never thought about it. And so I started to study it out and it's one of these. And like, why did God write this this way? And 
I don't know yet, so I'm not going to teach it to you yet. <laughs> but so there are things that God puts in the Bible, and He wrote He wrote the Bible actually the way that He wrote it, so that just anybody can't pick it up and understand it. He wants people to have the Holy Spirit of God so that they can have the Word of God so that they can properly use what they have. So a mystery is a truth that has been hidden from a people for a period of time. God reveals His truth to whom He chooses when He chooses. God gave some specific promises to Israel. I'm going to look at two or three of those. But our study is actually going to be focused on the New Testament, but I want to show you how the thing works. So take your Bible and go to Deuteronomy 29.29. 29. Deuteronomy 29, 29. And I just selected some. These, these have no... These, I should say these are not all of the references that I could have chosen. These are just the ones that I did choose. So uh, Deuteronomy 29, 29 says, The secret things belong unto the Lord our God. But those things which are revealed belong unto us and to our children forever, that we may do all the words of this law. So the secret things belong unto the Lord. And then when he reveals them to you, then they belong to you. And then you need to share them with your, with your children and whoever else you get a chance to. All right. Uh, Psalm 78. Psalm 78. And we want to look at verses 1 through 3. Okay, Psalm 78, 1. Give ear, O my people, to my law. Incline your ears to the words of my mouth. I will open my mouth in a parable. I will utter dark sayings of old, which we have heard and known, and our fathers have told us. So we have the word of God. And we are to share the Word of God. So we need to listen to it. And we need to, once we learn it, to then share it. And when he, when he says there, I will open my mouth in a parable, I will utter dark sayings of old. That just means that he's going to utter the mysteries, the dark sayings, the things that you couldn't see because... God hadn't turned the light on, on them for you as of yet. That's what he's talking about there. Okay, and then Isaiah 45. Okay, Isaiah 45, verses 1 to 6. Isaiah 45, 1. 
Thus saith the Lord to his anointed, to Cyrus, whose right hand I have holden to subdue nations before him, and I will loose the loins of kings to open before him the two lead gates, and the gates shall not be shut. I will go before thee and make the crooked places straight. I will break in pieces the gates of brass and cut in, in sunder the bars of iron. And I will give thee the treasures of darkness and hidden riches of secret places that thou mayest know that I the Lord which call thee by thy name and the Lord God of Israel. For Jacob my servant's sake and Israel mine elect I have even called thee by thy name I have surnamed thee though thou hast not known me. I am the Lord and there is none else there is no God beside me I, gird thee, I girded thee though thou hast not known me. Here's the thing. Isaiah wrote that way before Cyrus was even born. And what he's talking about is how that the Persian army would take Babylon. You with me? Before Cyrus was ever born, God told Isaiah the prophet who he was and what he was going to do. It says there that, that uh, he says, I will loose the loins of the king to open before him the two leaved gates, and the gates shall not be shut. The two leaved gates was the huge gates that led into the city of Babylon. He said that he's going to straighten uh, verse 2. He says, I will go before thee and make the crooked places straight. I will break in pieces the gates of brass and cut asunder the bars of iron. So what happened? The Persian army came into Babylon under the wall because they stopped up by diverting the water of the Euphrates River that ran under the walls, they was able to walk right under the walls of Babylon, right through the bars of iron and brass, and go in and swing open the gates and let the army in. Isaiah prophesied that before Cyrus was ever born. That is an Old Testament mystery that we now know the answer to it because it's happened. But that was a prophetic mystery. All right. So I want to show you, if you take your Bibles, you should be in Isaiah. Go back to Isaiah 28. I want to show you how the Word of God is written. <clears throat> Go to verse 9. Isaiah 28 and verse 9. It says, Whom shall he teach knowledge, and whom shall he make to understand doctrine? Then that are weaned from milk and drawn from the breast. For precept must be upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line. Here a little and there a little. For with, a stammer, with stammering lips and another tongue will he speak to his people. Verse 12. To whom he said, This is the rest wherewith ye may cause the weary to rest, and this is the refreshing, yet ye have not heard. Yet they have not heard. Verse 13. But the word of the Lord was unto them, precept upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little and there a little that they might go, watch this, that they might go and fall backward and be broken and snared and taken. The Bible is written in such a way 
that you cannot read it. And I know I said this before a hundred times probably. You don't read it like any other book. Because you have to compare Scripture with Scripture. We'll talk about that a little bit later on. I wanted to share this passage with you since we was right there by it. But God wrote His Bible, precept upon precept, and line upon line, here a little and there a little. That's why in the mornings and in the evenings, <laughs> we bounce all over the Bible because we need to put the doctrine together the way that God preserved it for us so that we can see the truth of the Word of God because it's consistent all the way through the Word of God. So God kept some truth concealed in Old Testament times, but has now revealed those mysteries to the church. Now we go to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. First Corinthians chapter 2, we'll look at verses 7 through 14. First Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 7 says, But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world unto our glory, which none of the princes of the world knew. For had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But as it is written, I have not seen nor ear heard, neither hath entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. But God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit. For the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. For what man knoweth the things of man, save the spirit of man which is in him? Even so, the things of God knoweth no man but the Spirit of God. Now we have re received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. Which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. Verse 14, But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. When a person comes to the Bible without the aid and anointing of the Holy Spirit of God, they cannot understand the Bible because it is spiritually discerned. The reason that we have so many translations of the Bible is men trying to do away with the need for the Holy Spirit of God to understand what God's saying. And it doesn't work. Every time they try it, they end up with a mess. You have to have the Holy Spirit of God to understand the Word of God. God fixed it that way. Let's go to Colossians chapter 1, verses 25 and 26. Does anybody have any question about what we've talked about so far? Just We haven't got to the mysteries yet. I'm laying the foundation here. So Colossians chapter 1, verses 25 and 26. Verse 24 says, Who now rejoice in my sufferings for you, and fill up that which is behind of the afflictions of Christ in my flesh for his body's sake, which is the church. Now here's the verses we was looking for. Verse 25, Whereof I am made a minister according to the dispensation of God, which is given to me for you to fulfill the word of God even the mystery which hath been hid from ages and from generations, but now is made manifest to his saints. 
Remember what we read in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 8. That had the princes of the world known the things that they, the Old Testament told them, they would not have crucified Christ. But Christ must needs be, be crucified so that we could have our salvation to fulfill all kinds of prophecy in the Old Testament that they didn't understand. But had they have understood it, and it's the princes of this world, that's Satan's boys. Had they understood what was going to happen when they crucified Christ, they would have never done it. They lost. They lost everything they was after when they crucified Christ. When he said, it is finished, it was finished for them. It was just beginning for us. That's the reason that the Bible is written the way that it is. Go to 1 Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter chapter 1. So we're just laying out the foundation here. We haven't got to the mysteries yet, so we're still in good shape here. Lay in the foundation. 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 10 through 13. Verse 10 says, Of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently, who prophesied of the grace that should come unto you, searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ, which was in them, did signify when it testified before, beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow. Unto whom it was revealed that not unto themselves, but unto us they did minister the things which are now reported unto you by them that have preached the gospel unto you, with the Holy Ghost sent down from heaven, which things the angels desi desire to look into. Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. God wrote His Bible in mystery form, so that the people that would understand his Bible was exactly the people that he wanted to understand his Bible exactly when he wanted, to under, wanted them to understand it. Romans chapter 16. Verses 25 and 26. Romans chapter 16, verses 25 and 26. Verse 25 says, Now to him that is of power to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery which was kept secret since the world began, but now is made manifest and by the scriptures of the prophets according to the commandment of the everlasting God made known to all nations for the obedience of faith. To God only wise be glory through Jesus Christ forever. Amen. So God revealed it in God's time. Salvation through Jesus Christ was God's plan before the foundations of the world were laid. Amen. We've seen that in Ephesians chapter 1. 
and also in, in First Peter, First or Second Peter, I don't remember which one. But it was kept a mystery all through Old Testament times. The Old Testament prophets wrote about it, but they didn't understand it. They wrote about it because the Holy Spirit of God inspired them to write about it, but they didn't understand what they were writing about. If God is able to do that, here's, here's my take on this. If God is able to do that with these men who were obviously righteous men, obviously very intelligent men, but God was able to use them to write His Bible and to give His message to the nations, and they didn't even understand what they were saying. That's a God you don't want to trifle with. In my way of thinking. But now, we see their writings and we can understand it because one thing, here's, here's the thing, how many times have you ever said, man, I wish I knew this was going to happen before I did that. Hindsight's 2020. So we can look back and we can see the fulfillment of the Word of God because it's hindsight. But there's still prophecy that's not fulfilled and that's not quite as clear to us. That's exactly the way it was with the Old Testament prophets. So that's the mysteries. Now let's talk about the steward. The steward. Remember, 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 4. Go back and refresh our memories here, what we're talking about. Verses 1 and 2 says, Let a man so account of us as of the ministers of Christ and the stewards and stewards of the mysteries of God. Moreover, it is required in, a stu in stewards that a man be found faithful. So, we've talked about the mystery and what it is, the definition of it, and defined it through different passages in the Bible. So let's talk about the steward now. The steward is the manager over a household. Someone who is given charge over something belonging to another. We are stewards of the mysteries of God. Those mysteries belong to God. We're just stewards of them. We're just taking care of them. We, as the church, are given stewardship over them. Go to 2 Timothy chapter 2. Verse 1 says, Thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And the things, verse 2, And the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. That's stewardship. That's taking the things that God gives you and giving them to somebody else correctly. Understanding the mysteries will preserve sound doctrine, thus preventing bad doctrine. People get confused by the mysteries and they come up with their own doctrine and that never works out well. So I want to give you a caution here. Beware 
that much knowledge can bring much pride. 1 Corinthians chapter 8. Verses 1 to 3. First Corinthians chapter 8 and verse 1 says, Now as touching things offered unto idols, we know that we all have knowledge. Knowledge puffeth up, but charity edifieth. If any man, verse 2, if any man think that he knoweth anything, he knoweth nothing, yet as he ought to know. But if any man love God, the same is known of him. What we're about to get off into is knowledge that is beyond what probably 90% of the pastors in American churches today even understand about the Bible. I'm not sharing it with you. I'm teaching it to you for the reason of making it look like I know everything because I don't know everything. There's a lot of things I don't know. Nor is it so that you can say, wow, I know this and you don't know it. My kids in school, you know. No. It's just so that we have a better understanding of the Word of God so that we keep our doctrine pure and so that when somebody comes at us with bad doctrine, we recognize it. The main thing that we want to keep in mind, that is, if any man love God, the same is known of him. We want people to know that we love God. How do we know, how do, how do people know that we love God? Because we spend time with Him. How do we spend time with Him? In His Word. All right, amen. And in prayer. And so that's what it's really all about. It's not, it's not to give you uh, a, a big head. Uh, it's to give you solid, a, a solid foundation. So there are two sets of mysteries. One to the nation of Israel. We looked at a couple of those. And the other is for the church. And we're going to be looking at those that apply to the church. Keep in mind that your attitude determines how much of the Word of God that God will give you. Your attitude does. Go to Matthew chapter 11. Matthew chapter 11, verses 25 through 27. Verse 25 says, at, this time, at that time, Jesus answered and said, I thank thee, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because thou hast hid these things from the wise and prudent and hast revealed them unto babes. Even so, Father... For so it seemed good in thy sight. All things are delivered unto me of my Father. And no man knoweth the Son but the Father. Neither knoweth any man the Father save the Son. And he to whom, whomsoever the Son will reveal him. Then Matthew 13. We'll look at verses 10 through 18. It 
Matthew 13 and verse 10 says, And the disciples came and said unto him, Why speakest thou unto them in parables? He answered and said unto them, Because it is given unto you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it is not given. For whosoever hath to him shall be given, and he shall have more abundance. But so, whosoever hath not from him shall be taken away, even that he hath. Therefore speak I to them in parables, because they see and see not, and hearing they hear not, neither do they understand. Verse 14. And in them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah, which saith, By hearing ye shall hear, and shall not understand. And seeing ye shall see, and shall not perceive. For this people's heart is waxed gross, and their ears are dull of hearing. And their eyes have closed, their, their eyes they have closed, lest at any time they should see with their eyes. And, their, and hear with their ears and should understand with their heart and should be converted and I should heal them. But blessed are your eyes for they see and your ears for they hear. For verily I say unto you that many prophets and righteous men have desired to see those things which ye shall see and have not seen them and to hear those things which ye hear and have not heard them. So here's what's going on in Matthew chapter 13. They had just accused Jesus of healing a guy in the power of Beelzebub. The spiritual leaders of the nation of Israel had rejected Jesus Christ. And so he started teaching his disciples in parables. And the disciples are coming to him going, why are you teaching like this? And so he explains to them, because I don't want them guys to know what I'm saying. They have rejected me. You haven't rejected me. It's an attitude thing. And so people say, well, the, the parables are just heavenly stories or just stories, earthly stories in a heavenly language. That's not what they are. Jesus said what they are is that they are in, in parables, verse 13. Therefore speak I to them in parables, because they see and see not, and hearing they hear not, neither do they understand. He spoke to them in parables because he didn't want them to see, he didn't want them to hear, he didn't want them to understand, because they had rejected him and accused him, and accused him of casting out devils in the power of Satan himself. He said, okay. I can take rejection. I'm done with you. And he moved on. Now, that was the religious leaders. Let me just add to that a little bit. We have a whole lot of religious leaders today that have the same attitude. They don't care what the Bible says. They're going to do what they want to do for the reason that they want to do it. And you know what? God blinds their eyes just like He did in the Old Testament. So they go and they drag up some stone dead translation of the Scripture that they can make up something to make it sound like they're intelligent and have a relationship with God and God is nowhere around them. All right, enough of that. We will not be going through these mysteries in any particular order of significance. This is just the way I have them listed out in my Bible. So... When I say mystery number one, that just means this is the number one I had listed in my Bible. So, so mystery number one. Go to 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16. The first one I have listed is the mystery of godliness. The mystery of godliness.
1 Timothy 3 and verse 16. And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up into glory. The mystery of godliness. The God of creation manifest in the flesh. He came to earth, born as a baby, and grew to be a man. This mystery was pictured and prophesied in the Old Testament all the way back in Genesis chapter 22, verses 1 to 8. And again, I'm giving you a couple of verses here. I'm not giving you all of them. There's a lot of them in the Old Testament. Genesis chapter 22, verse 1. And it came to pass after these things that God did tempt Abraham and said unto him, Abraham, and he said, Behold, here, am I, here I am. And he said, Take now thy son, thine only son Isaac, whom thou lovest, and get thee into the land of Moriah, and offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains, which I will tell thee of. And Abraham rose up early in the morning, and saddled his ass, and took two of his young men with him, and Isaac his son, and clave the wood for the burnt offering, and rose up and went unto the place of which God had told him. Then on the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes, and saw the place afar off. And Abraham said unto his young men, Abide ye here with the ass. Now watch what he says. And I and the lad will go yonder and worship and come again to you. Don't miss that part. Verse 6. And Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it upon Isaac his son and took the fire in his hand and a knife and they went both of them together. And Isaac spake unto Abraham his father and said, My father? And he said, Here am I, my son. And he said, Behold, the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? Look at verse 8. And Abraham said, My son, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. So they went both of them together. What did God do? provided himself for a burnt offering. Is that awesome? Some things I want to point out here. Number one is Abram told the young man to wait because me and the lad's coming back. That's faith. Because God had told him that Isaac was the chosen seed that would be the seed of the nation of Israel. And then later, here in chapter 22, he tells him, go kill him. Abraham said, okay, I'm going to go kill him. But he tells the boys, he goes, we're coming back. He knew God was going to keep his promise because all the way through the Bible, God had kept his promise without fail. And then he, he tells us, Isaac, he goes, Isaac goes, uh, where's the offering? <laughs> and he tells him, God will provide himself the offering. Something that sometimes gets missed in that story, especially if you have children's Bibles, and they show little, they show little Isaac, you know, a young lad carry. No, Isaac. Go back and, and read through. You can, you can work it out. Isaac was somewhere between thirty and thirty-three years old. He was in the prime of his life. Abraham, on the other hand, would have been a hundred and thirty-some years old. He was not in the prime of his life. 
But the, the son was obedient to the father. Now, do you know another son who was 33 years old and he says, I do always those things that please my father? It's the Lord Jesus Christ. The picture was all the way back in Genesis chapter 22. And it carried all the way through. Isaac was the same age when Abraham was taking him to offer him up, up on the altar as the Lord Jesus Christ was when God the Father offered him up on the altar for you and me. Yes. That's a good one, ain't it? <laughs> Isaiah chapter 9 and verse 6. Lighten it up a little bit here. That's tremendous stuff, man. Yes, sir. So Moses wrote that. Back right after the, the nation of Israel was coming out of Egypt. When they had come out of Egypt, Moses wrote the book of Genesis. That was hundreds of years after the case, after it happened. That was 430, probably 600 years after the fact. But it was thousands of years before the birth of Christ. The Old Testament, all the rabbis, all the people, they had all this Old Testament writings of Moses and they didn't put it together. Isn't that amazing? Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. For, for unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder and his name shall be called wonderful watch the names here his name shall be called wonderful counselor the mighty god the everlasting father the prince of peace wait a minute i thought his name was jesus so now who do you reckon he is he's god in the flesh prophesied by Isaiah all those years ago. The mystery of godliness. That's just two places in the Old Testament. There's bunches of them. So it was pictured and prophesied in the Old Testament. The Lord Jesus Christ willingly gave up his position on the throne in heaven to take on himself the curse of sinful man. Philippians chapter 2. Verses 5 through 8. Philippians 2.5 Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus who being in the form of God thought it not robbery to be equal with God but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men and being found in fashion as a man he humbled himself and became obedient unto death even the death of the cross. How far am I going with this? Verse 9 says, Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth. And that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. The mystery of godliness. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 21. 
2 Corinthians 5, 21 says, For he hath made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Second Corinthians chapter 8, and verse 9. Second Corinthians 8 and 9 says, For ye know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that ye through his poverty might be rich. The mystery of godliness. God came as a man in a man's body. We just seen that in Philippians chapter 2 and verse 8. He had a virgin, miraculous con conception and birth to be the Son of God. Go to Isaiah chapter 7 and verse 14. Isaiah chapter 7 verse 14 says, Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall, and shall call his name Emmanuel. Jesus experienced temptation, rejection, pain, and death as a man. Let's go to Hebrews chapter 2. I'll get there in a minute. Hebrews chapter 2, verses 16 through 18. Verse 16 says, For verily he took not on him the nature of angels, but he took on him the seed of Abraham. Wherefore, in all things it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. For in that he himself suffered being tempted, he is able to secure them that are tempted. Go to Hebrews chapter 4, verse 14. It says, Seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Verse 16, Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. Jesus could only be our high priest because he became a man and took on all the things that we took on, all the temptation, all the rejection, all the pain, and even up to the death. So that he could become our great high priest. Go to 1 Peter chapter 2. Verse 21 and following. Verse 21 says, For even hereto, hereunto were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that ye should follow his steps. Who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth. Who, when he was reviled, reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judgeth righteously. 
who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree, that we being dead to sins should live unto righteousness by whose stripes you were healed. For ye were as sheep going astray, but are now returned unto the shepherd and bishop of your souls. As a man, Jesus did not know the day nor the hour of the second coming. Look in Mark chapter 13. Mark chapter 13 and verse 32. Let's go back to verse 30. Verse 30 says, Verily I say unto you, that this generation shall not pass till all these things be done. 31. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. Now here it is, verse 32. But of that day and that hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels which are in heaven, neither the Son, but the Father. Take heed, take ye heed, watch and pray, for ye know not when the time is. The Jehovah's Witnesses use this verse for their basis of their teaching that Jesus is not God. So the next time, my friends, that a Jehovah's Witness shows up to your door, just take them over to 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16 and ask them to explain who that is. They will leave you very quickly. Because you read that verse and it shows you exactly who it is. It's Jesus Christ and He was God in the flesh. So God came as a man in a, as a man in a man's body. God came down from heaven and lived among men. The word was God, the word was made flesh. Go to the Gospel of John chapter 1. John chapter 1 and verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Now verse 14. And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory as the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Jesus Christ and His Father are one. Go to John chapter 10 and verse 30. It's pretty simple. John chapter 10 and verse 30 says, I and my Father are one. We are to be looking for the return of the great God. Titus chapter 2 and verse 13. Titus. Yeah. Titus chapter 2 verse 13. Let's go back to verse 11. 
It says, For the grace of God, Titus 2.11, <clears throat> For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. Now look at verse 13. <clears throat> Looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the true God. 1 John chapter 5 and verse 20. 1 John 5, 20. And we know that the Son of God is come and hath given us an understanding that we may know that we may know him that is true and we are in him that is true even his is in his son Jesus Christ this is the true God and eternal life So that is the mystery of godliness. God manifest in the flesh. That's our first mystery and the only one you're going to get tonight. Yes, sir. You might throw in 1 John 3.16 Hereby perceive we the word of God because He laid down His life for us. That's true. There's a whole lot of them that I could have put in there, but we got to stop at some point. <laughs> but yeah, that, 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 that is a good verse. So next time, we will pick up with the mystery of the indwelling Holy Spirit. But that's all we have for tonight. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we do love you and thank you for loving us. Father, I thank you for the folks who are here tonight. Lord, I thank you so much for your word. Father, I thank you for your Holy Spirit that you've given us, that teaches us your word. And Father, for the fact that you wrote it in such a way that we have to study in order to understand it. We have to put it together like a puzzle. But Father, you give us everything we need. We, you gave us your full word. You gave us all of the Holy Spirit of God. Lord, I just pray for everybody in this room tonight. I pray for everybody that, that watches this message on the video. That, Lord, your Holy Spirit would work on their hearts. That they would dig deeper. What we're doing here is, is the tip of the iceberg of what your Holy Word has to say. And, Father, I just pray that we would, that we would be faithful to study your word, to work at it. But most importantly, Lord, that we would apply the things that we learn in our lives. That, Lord, we would live the way that you saved us to live so that we'd be an honor to you. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.